And essentially what this would create for us if we're to talk about in a world scale is the world. But like in terms of countries, mm -hmm. counties, towns. But it's a case of thinking of this circuit board as absolutely huge with potential additions added on. We see things replicated all over the world, don't we? You know, We saw these before. This is like meant to be one of the biggest motherboards in the world. But look at that. Hey everyone, I'd like to welcome you to a deeper conversation with Michelle Gibson and Adam Shakofka. Welcome guys. Great to be here, Chad. Likewise, Chad, great to be here. <laughs> so today we're going to be um, exploring further the energy harvesting, the Earth's grid, everything we've touched upon on, on lap mine and Michelle's last video, the Mother Earth video, um, and just taking it a lot further. Um, Adam's going to be bringing a lot in regards to his finding, which is just all over the place. Absolutely amazing. Michelle, as always, with her just incredible research, is going to take us all over the board as well. So really, guys, I'm going to let you, you know, lead the way, Michelle. Um, you've brought a, built a presentation, haven't you? So um, we'll guide our way through that. And I'll add some points along the way, guys. Welcome to the journey, guys. Let's go. We were talking that the three of us have different gifts related to the Earth's energy grid system and what's going on that really complement each other nicely. Um, so we've been pinging off each other with the information that that Chad's been uncovering and information that I've been uncovering and information that Adam's been uncovering. And um, it's all connected to bringing forward a much bigger and clearer picture of exactly what we're talking about with the Earth's grid system, how it was originally constructed. And I absolutely it was believe it was originally constructed for the benefit of all life and as a free energy generating electromagnetic grid system based on sacred geometry. Adam has some incredible abilities. Um, if you want to talk a little bit, Adam, about what you do and um, what your able to piece together from your your special abilities. Yeah, so uh, my special abilities is uh, that I've always been um, guided by the Earth energy grid and the, and, the, and the Earth energy lines. I've always been guided through synchronicities and downloads, knowing that, you know, I am being guided for it from my personal experiences through family life, that we had to go through some of the traumatic experiences. We've always had that guidance where to go, and then it's led me into realizing that, you know, there is something else out there, a greater force that we connect to, we can receive the support and get all the answers we, we need. There's that um, divine source creation that we're all connected to. So that led me to that creation. And then that led me on to the work we actually do now, which is um, house healing and healing people's energies, looking through the earth grid and how the earth energies affect people's health and biology. So that's the kind of work that I do now, as well as being a researcher alongside the work that I do as well to uncover the history, the um, histories that have been hidden from us, like both are doing Michelle and, and Chad, to get the truth out there to people, basically. And so the title of this presentation is Compelling Evidence for the Harvesting of the Earth's Original Energy Grid System and Us. And... For the three of us, I mean, it probably goes back a little ways anyway, but Chad put out two videos not too long ago. Um, one was his original video on giant trees, and another was a video that he did on, on amuse, uh, was it amusement parks, asylums? Amusement parks, asylums in the old world. Yep. So those two videos are directly connected to the information we're going to be providing in this presentation and also um, the interview that Chad and I did not too long ago where he did a conversation with me about giant trees and other related things and then Adam provided some feedback from that of things that he found after watching that conversation between Chad and I and then I put out a uh, Actually, it was a re-upload of a series I did several years ago that was very relevant um, called 
bonanza, the correlation of mining and mineral occurrences on the Earth's energy grid. And Adam came back with some incredible uh, findings based on that particular video that we're going to be talking about. And um, and so that kind of leads us here. Uh, Chad and Adam, um, not too long ago, Chad put out his energy harvesting video based on his findings in Oxford around his birthday. And then Adam did a part of that to show the relationship between the Twin Cities with Oxford. And then there was more stuff about the grid lines coming out from that, from what Chad was finding. Um, so all of those videos are good to to watch in conjunction with the conversation we're about to have, mm -hmm. um, because this led to, led to us talking here today about joint findings um, that contribute to all of this, and you know how the harvesting is happening, where it's happening. Um, you know, there's just so much information here, and it's mind blowing in scope. Uh -huh. The Earth's grid is real, and the harvesting of the Earth's grid and us is real. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because uh, I put a PowerPoint together to make sure that we are able to touch on all the points that we were finding together. And um, I'm going to go ahead and go to my first part. Or I'm going to go to this part called Deer Parks, Asylums, and Homeless Shelters and the connections and you know what might really be going on here. And so um, Chad identified Deer Parks in the research that he was doing on the amusement park and asylum video and sent this information on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, just as, you know, in terms of what's out there about deer parks. And I'm going to, Chad, if you can talk about your findings, and then we can talk about deer parks a little bit. Yeah, so um, obviously, through watching the, the other videos, you might see that I use a lot of old maps. And um, I, it, I was researching my own area's history as well, and I was coming across the term deer park a lot. So it turns out that these deer parks were, as you are aware, are, um, were significant of the past. The things that seem to be important, the enclosed walls, they've then been turned into manors and theme parks and national parks and other type ventures for attractions, um, which speaking about the energy harvesting, you know, um, especially at theme parks and taking energy from from one point of joy to fear um these places seem to be key they seem to be um very important and what they even tell us and what you can find easily on a search sounds kind of weird um you know it's an enclosed area containing deer you know just looking at what wiki says bounded by a ditch and bank with a wooden park pail on top of the bank or by a stone or brick wall, the ditch on the inside, increasing the height, and some had leaps. You know, an external ramp and the inner ditch was constructed on a grander scale, allowing deer to enter the park, but preventing them from leaving. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, the whole story that goes along with it is, is very strange. And, um, you know, it says it started after the Norman conquest of England in 1066 when William the Conqueror ex seized existing game reserves. And that's when deer parks were flourishing under the Normans and, you know, all that other stuff. Um, Norman Keynes maintained an exclusive right to keep and hunt deer and established forest law for this purpose. And then, it, <laughs> you know, identifying former deer parks, I, and I pulled that out to talk about Um about the reconstruction and that they were bounded by significant earthworks topped by a park pail, typically of cleft oak stakes. They have a curving rounded plan, possibly to economize on the materials. 
Do deer parks in areas with plentiful building stone had stone walls instead of a park pale? Um, now, now you this, know, any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, to, to, to me, Michelle, there's two things. We were, All three of us were talking about it earlier, weren't we? If we, you know, this, there's a, a really strange uh, and uh, similarity between what we're in as reality to the park itself. You know, some may argue that we're in a, a huge park ourselves with 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 the walls etc um but what are what are finding just putting that aside what i find interesting about that the parks themselves i think we touched on it in the last video when we were talking about people living in trees or you know that type of avatar type scenario these rounded places of power because i think parks are obviously very significant in terms of location as well we find the mining has happened there on all the old maps parks were you know and me and adam found also that the in the name park in in one of the videos i've done parks is the name arc and you know the arc is significant isn't it not only in power generation but also in if you look at it as noah's arc keeping a particular type of keeping energy all in one place or a particular peoples in one place parks make me think of car parking and par and cars now if we change the k on the end to a c and it's an anagram we find car in it and also if an anagram of that is a carp if we change the k again to a c we get the word carp and in the uk especially i'm unsure about in the us carp pools are huge Carp pools, again, pools, water, water. Um, we spoke about potentially, be, well, being a huge energy source, the reservoirs and all the water reserves across the earth. But yeah, that was just something I was looking at earlier, just looking at the actual word of of of, of park itself. And there's a, there's a lot in it. And obviously we know the, the D can be flipped or the P can be flipped to become a D or a B. So when we start doing that, we get a lot of different words pop up that all seem to be related. And Adam pointed out in one video about Karnak. Um, and it's nearly there, you know, it's, it's very much there in the name as well with Park and Karnak was um, the two Karnaks, isn't there, Ad, with the, the C and the one with the K. Mm -hmm. One's in Egypt and there's another one in, in France. France and Brittany. Yeah. In Brittany. Yeah. And one's with a K and one's with a C. That's it. So uh, me with the letters, I'm very much like that, Michelle. I like to, or often, because I know back in time, they use different letters and it's easy to hide other things in the letters. So a K could easily be a C, you know, a P could easily be a B or a B could be a D. And it might sound strange right. to some, but it does reveal lots of links by just flipping letters. Right. And it, it's also important to note that Early modern languages like early, early modern English and early modern Scots and early modern Spanish and early, early modern French all came about around the same time. Yeah. And so it's extraordinarily interesting um, to do research on that because that was when all these new languages came in. And, um, you know, that they've been tinkering with everything. So, you know, why not tinker with the language? And um, I've been doing some research about that. And it's interesting because you asked me, were there deer parks over here? Mm -hmm. And I, I got back to you. I said, well, there was a deer park road where I grew up. And that's um, outlined in the red here. And I, I grew up right around here because the swimming pool I went to when I was a kid was at London Dairy Apartments. So this was really close to where I grew up. Wow. And... Um, and so Chad got back to me right away. Um, and before I go into that, I'll say there's a Borer Park here. Um, Price Mother Park, there's elementary schools. Um, actually, a lot of stuff going on here um, in this place where I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. So kind of interesting, a Muddy Branch Road. <laughs> muddy Branch. So Chad got back to me right away with a quarry that he found on Deer Park Road, my Deer Park Road, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and Chad, you were finding quarries when you were doing the research, following the maps and finding the deer parks and everything, right? Yeah, 
yeah, lots of them. Huge ones like this one, just in key locations and very close to amusement parks, very close to other att attractions, if you like, yeah, or uh, significant places, airports, amusement parks. Um, yeah, seem to be placed. It's, um, to me, I could just see the tree outline in a lot of it, Michelle, and I, I think, you know, there's a lot in yours that are potential beans of other sorts, but a lot of them are trees, I would I'd definitely argue. And so, so far we've got a connection with Deer Park on both sides of the Atlantic. You know, the finding of some kind of quarrying and something going on. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to you know put out that this is energy harvesting and, you know, there's a lot of that going on where you see sites like that of some kind. You see that with places that you can see the star port that's been peeled, you know, the, the layers have been peeled off and you can still see the bastions and things like that. I've come across those in my research. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's definitely that going on. Uh, but I want to kind of tie something else in because this is this is rather curious here. Um, I'm going to talk about Colney Hatch a little bit. And this was something that a commenter left me to take a look at Colney Hatch. And Colney Hatch is in the London borough of Barnett. It marked the southern boundary of the Royal Hunting Ground of Enfield Chase in the hamlet of Southgate. Is it Southgate? And then I, I saw down here, um, there's a, there was a windmill here. Um, and I'm gonna have you talk a little bit about that, Chad. The Royal Hunting Ground of Enfield Chase and before we move on to the lunatic asylum that was here, I want Chad to talk a little bit about windmills. And, you know, I, I think there's a very likely possibility that these deer parks and royal hunting grounds were hunting something very different from deer. I mean, that's really the sense that I'm get, gonna get. And you're gonna see more examples of why I, I believe that um, in the next couple of slides. but. Chad, if you can talk about windmills a little bit, I'll I'll let Adam talk about the 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 energy. The, is that all right? Ad? the positive energy uh, from a windmill. But just quickly before that, because windmills are related potentially like to obelisks and other things like that, like the male energy. But one observation I want to make before Adam speaks on it is, um, I told you about. I think we might get to it, but about flipping the W to an M. Um, Again, back to this etymology and letters. Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm on that at the moment. But the W could be in M and then we get mind mill. Or if we change the W in mill, we get will. And you know mills were horrible places and, you know, it broke people's will. It's there in the words, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So these places, asylums, and you're talking about that these deer parks potentially weren't deer parks. And, and I know... And I'm with you, you know, there's a there's a darker side to all this as well. And if we if we just read that as mind will or wind willed, you know, it's talking about bending people's will or breaking people's will. And you were talking about mills and workhouses being programming centers of some kind. Yeah, you know, I feel there's a lot of evidence out there pointing towards these asylums and um hospitals all these massive scale buildings that you see from the past are all to do with this reprogramming um forgetting the past you know um basically locking away a, a problem locking away the problems and you know that would be people like me and you <laughs> and adam <laughs> um or people that have sort of seen too much, lots of lots of reasoning. And you know, there's so much to back this up without going too much into it. Um, and even down to, you know, people reading and writing and just lost history, resets, it all falls into the same type of well, it is, it's all the same thing. And I think all three of us kind of feel the same around these asylums and hospitals. Which are now, by the way, the asylums you know have turned into either hospitals or, or prisons, or they're still used in the world today. That that energy is still being harnessed. The programming is still going on. 
within the prisons, within the hospitals, and it's it's energy as well as programming. I often think it's dual or it can be used one way. It's harvesting the energy, but it's also transmuting or influencing people, programming them, if you like, you know, and like what our TV does, all these things in society, it's two-tone, but uh, yeah, to answer your question, sorry, Michelle. Okay. No, that's great. And I'm going to have some examples of what you were just talking about. Adam, what's your read on this? Yeah, so I completely agree with what um, Chad is saying about, obviously, windmills in particular can be used as a harvesting um, device, if you like. There's uh, windmills, traditional windmills for uh, for wheat and barley. Obviously, that's you done usually during the harvest season. And because the, the shape of the mills are located in a spherical kind of um, cone, cone shape that encourages the energy to naturally um, swirl in a, in, a, in a kind of vortex because of the the shape of the actual windmills and the structure of it. So it's basically using the Earth's actual energies because if you look at a lot of the windmills, they're placed and built on areas which have got um, energy lines and windmills are usually built on top of hills and some kind of mound, mounds in order to harvest that uh, wind energy, in order to grind all the corn and wheat that it's supposed to do. And because there are a lot of energy lines going on it, they're using the energy from the energy lines in order to produce something. In this case, windmills, if they're producing wheat, for example, they're using that natural energy from the wind and the earth, which does in fact produce electricity as well, needed in order to um, produce all the grinding mechanisms in order to produce a certain product. So even that product would be like flour, for example. So they're used very symbolically. And windmills to me remind me similar to lighthouses, whereas lighthouses are associated with the coast and the sea, and they serve a similar kind of purpose because they're in a similar kind of shape mm -hmm. as a windmill inland. So in my opinion, windmills are the equivalent of like a lighthouse, as you would see in on the coast in order to for, to serve a certain purpose, whether that be to help people or to be used in um, in other instances. It's um, debatable depending on uh, what the purpose of it originally was. Right. So it's and definitely I, used as a type of energy harvesting, I believe. And what I'm finding in my research is that lighthouses served a much greater purpose than what they're advertised as on the Earth's grid system. Probably something so, to so actually do with light light energy yes. carrying light distributing the energy so they're they're significant and you know windmills and so-called water towers look like lighthouses too so there's a lot of um, obfuscation that we're the recipients of um, did you have any other comments Adam on the grid this this particular location as um, you know called infield chase and what they might actually have been hunting there and yeah. Its relationship to the grid. Absolutely. Yeah, further in the uh, in the PowerPoint, I've got my own presentation that I've set up, and it includes a forest which has got which is a royal hunting ground, which one of the lays come through. So I'll mention a bit more about that further in the um, in the video. So that's an important aspect. So I refer back to what you were just saying here. That will confirm another location for you. Because now we're gonna we're gonna head on into like a primo example of what we're talking about. So I mentioned that the um, the insane asylum in Colony Hatch is located right next to this on the southern boundary of this park. Before I go into the asylum, I thought it was interesting to note the Southgate Underground Station that's located there. Looking kind of like a ray gun there at the top or something. And so it's got the circular shape and then it's got this... Uh, interesting device up here that looks kind of like science fiction or something mm -hmm. so another rail and we're going to talk about rails again here in just a moment so the underground and this was the uh, it became known as the Friern uh, Insane Asylum in Colney Hatch and it opened in 1851, which is like a red letter year and all this reset narrative. That was the same year as the Crystal Palace, Ex Crystal Palace exhibition in London was in 1851. A lot going on during that time. 
and the term Colney Hatch became associated with the concept of madness. The new Southgate Railway first opened in 1850 near the Lunatic Asylum. Train service stopped daily at what became known as the Friar Hospital. Today, the former Lunatic Asylum uh, was converted into luxury apartments. And I believe you've talked about that previously, Chad. The, the asylum is being repurposed into something else. So like in this case, luxury apartments. Yeah. We, so what I seem to find is the asylums get repurposed for some some reason. But what we've got, it, what's important about it is, is the energy that still stays in those locations. It's almost like it's been tarnished or taken or manipulated. And then something has been put on top of that, that then absorbs that energy or then changes it back. You know, I feel, I feel with this one again, there's two ways to look at it. It could either be absorbing that energy from the asylums and all that negativity you know, they go into these places, take all the energy, drain all the resources, and then put something on top of it, like a park. The park then refills, potentially, all the energy refills that spot again, or the negative energy is being transmuted through those people, one of the two. So, yeah, cons consistently repurpose these asylums. So there's the park. Um, that's the other thing that the land was redeveloped into, was mm -hmm. the Friar and Village Park. And, you know, right next to the railway tra tracks here. Um, so, you know, the park theme comes up again. A retail park. <laughs> That's <laughs> just shops. It's full of shops. So, again, energy. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Necropolis Railway. I first heard of it in a video by Paul Cook that he did a couple of years ago. And the viewer that left me the comment about Colney Hatch said there was a connection with the London Necropolis Railway. And that was a railway line that uh, was said to have been developed along existing tracks of the London and Southwestern Railway, formerly known as the London and Southampton Railway. And it had um, as well main uh, branches from the main line and Brookwood. And Brookwood was a cemetery that it would take bodies and people to. So the Brookwood, oh, so this particular railway first opened in, 1950, in 1854, reportedly to transport corpses and mourners to the newly opened Brookwood Cemetery, also known as the London Necropolis in Brookwood, Surrey, at the time the largest cemetery in the world, located 23 miles or 37, mi 37 kilometers southwest of London. And it closed in April of 1941. Um, <laughs> hmm. Yeah, wow. And you've even got um, this picture of the cemetery from workhouses.org.uk. Um, and then you've got the, you know, the railroad tracks in the forest, you know, just a little bit left. And that's another thing we can talk about in different respects throughout all of this. But um, that sounds pretty weird to me. <laughs> Have you ever heard of it? Not not until you had you sent it me and I researched it and just thought it was weird. Yeah. Um... So they've got this need to transport all of these bodies to the world's largest cemetery at the time in the mid 1800s starting in the mid 1800s you know on the last one of the last videos michelle i showed another train station that had, was next to the asylum it was only made for the asylum it had its own train station so you asked the question you know and it was oh sorry it led to a brickyard it led to a brickyard where they made red bricks so you know you, you hate to put it all together, don't you? But yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it seems like they were killing people on mass scales in some in, in cases, doesn't it? And uh... yeah, I, I see the 19th century as an absolutely horrible time for humanity. Yeah. And um, yeah. but the thing is, they have to tell us 
they don't tell us in any other way, but you can find this information, you know, so it's out there if you look for it. Um, and then when you start connecting dots, it all kind of comes together into a clearer picture. And what's really interesting is, you know, you mentioned prisons and hospitals playing a similar, similar role today. And, you know, you find the same thing with homeless shelters. Mm -hmm. And um, I found this when I was looking around Vancouver, Washington and Portland, Oregon. And the Bybee Lakes Hope Center is a homeless shelter on top of a what looks like a star fort point. And it's right next to a wetlands natural area an urban wetlands and i'm i'm convinced that wetlands are ruined land that was previously part of this civilization that's partially sunk and um you know this is just a really good example because um you can't convince me that that's a natural feature there that the star fort point um so they've got this homeless center there now and um it's right next to rail yards Right next to it, that's you know that's what you see right here. It's the uh, BNSF Ford rail yard, and I'm finding it's not uncommon to find the presence of historical rail yards and rail lines co-located with estuaries and wetlands and star forts. You know, it's not unusual at all. And then uh, somebody left me a comment about Haven for Hope in Houston, a big homeless shelter there. And it's, you know, surrounded by rail lines here. And he was wondering, you know, what's what's going on here? Is there something um, dark that's actually going on here? Um, you know, how they treat the mentally ill and homeless population, you know, which nobody pays attention to anyway, you know. You know, same idea with orphanages and boarding schools, you know, things that we hear about and know about. But, you know, we're talking about people that have kind of been lost in the system, you know, lost to society, probably don't have any connections with people that may not even know where they are. And so, um, you know, it's just very suspicious. And you know, just putting it out there, there's looks like there's something going on. And before I move on to Critch Mount, is there anything else that you would like to add, anybody? The energy harvesting is seems to be going on on a few different scales. You know, you've got the mass one, which seems to be areas and places on the earth and buildings. But then you've got the the the, the lowest, well, it's not lower side, but the other side of human harvesting, and I think the homeless shelters and all of that which I think you're edging to, Michelle, plays a huge part in um in the nastier side of humanity itself. You know, we aren't it's it's a bit different what we're talking about harvesting the energy in a stadium compared to potentially, you know, kidnapping or taking these people to to put them through things. You know, I think these are prime centers for those missing people. But that's a completely different video. But I do right. think there's two sides to it. Right. Now this particular one's in Houston, Texas. Um, and it's not to suggest that they're all engaged in, you know, something nefarious. I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, but the person that left me the comment seemed to think that this particular one did have some connection with something that um, would have a darker implication. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to Critch Mount and Derbyshire. And um, why don't you guys go ahead and touch base on this because these are some conversations between you two yeah so uh, what basically um happened was um there was a random standing stone in a car park of an industrial estate local to me so i decided to uh, identify the energy lines going where it goes from and it happens to come across the same areas that michelle mentioned in her previous videos regarding the um the mining and the and the estuaries that she released and uh, this particular a line from where close to where I am, where the Standing Stone was, happens to go through Derbyshire, which Michelle mentioned in those videos. And when I looked a bit closer to where the ley line was, it happens to cross very close by to this place, Critch Mountain, Derbyshire. And what brought it to my attention was that um, there was a network of roads um, 
to this one like Michelle's discovered in her other videos with the rail links, um, the canals and the rivers. But just directly slightly to the south of this image, so if we go to the next show, you can see there's a there's a river running alongside it. You can see that there's a river running alongside um, Critch Mount here. Then there's a road alongside in the middle. And then there's a railway line running directly alongside. So you've got like the three um, timelines of transportations, basically. And there's also a canal that's located here as well. So you've got the four timelines of transportation. So you've got the river, you've got the canal, you've got the railway and the road located one next to this huge um, quarry site. And as um, Chad has mentioned in previous videos, quarries you know, were used for harvesting significance and they've all, all got that connection with um, with the railways, like he's mentioned as well. And this particular um, Critch Mount happens to have the Tram Museum. So it's got a, um, a tram a museum located on it because you used to have a tram line running through it. And as you can see, there's no large settlements nearby. Why would a quarry area have a tram system to transport it? What was it used for? Was it used to transport people to and from work, work when there's no settlements nearby? was it used for something else? So that raises that question. And I've consistently found, you know, canals next to rail track or railroad, railroad tracks and also railroad tracks next to dams and reservoirs. And, and these are just a few examples. I mean, there's countless examples out of there and they there's typically a story that goes along with it to explain it, but what doesn't match is the technology we're told that we had at the time being capable of constructing these massive long distance engineering projects of both the canal and the railroad tracks. And then the typical thing that goes along with that is that they stopped using the canal because the railroad was so much more efficient. You know, so it took them 20 years to build a canal, you know, say it was ready to go by the 1850s and then you know, too bad, so sad, they st stopped using them as transport because the railroads were more efficient. And that story goes along with, you know, countless examples. It makes no sense. Absolutely. Why well, spend all that investment over, you know, should cost a lot of money back then, only to be used for such a short period of time. You know, it doesn't make any, any sense at all. So you know, there had to be another purpose behind it. So definitely. You know, and again, I, I see all of this as part and parcel of this original grid system, free energy generating system. They're all, you know, it's all contributing to this worldwide, perfectly integrated system. And and this is one of the re reasons I firmly believe that this, the civilization that created this existed over a very, very long period of time. And I see one massive reset, but I just can't, you know, even fathom with what I see in my own research, that there were a lot of resets um, because I don't, you know, I just don't, I can't grasp how it would have been possible to have this integration if they were constantly rebuilding. And, and I'm just saying that's, that's where I'm coming from and why I come from there. It's because, you know, this is really sophisticated stuff. And, and you know, we're just looking at our little pieces of what we know and where we are, but my research has taken me following long distance alignments all over the earth and I'm finding the same things in very different places. So, um, so you mentioned the Sikh, the Sikh temple. The Sikh temple. Yeah. Cause, um, close to where I live, there's a, there's a Sikh temple called the Gaharada Sahib, which is the, um, third largest, um, Sikh building in the UK apparently. And this is situated very close by to one of the um, standing stones I've, I've um, discovered in my local area. So if you allow me to um, share the screen, I'll be able to... Sure. Um... Okay, so here's a close-up image of that particular um, Sikh temple. And as I'm sure one of the first things Michelle will probably notice are the um, onion domes at the top mm -hmm. and also the arches, which is um, typical of the Moorish um, architecture, which Michelle has gone into great detail in um, previous videos. And this, and this alignment goes directly from Mount Critch in Derbyshire through to um, Warwickshire. And then literally just um, down the road, there's a standing stone in a, um, 
in an industrial area in a car park of a corporation. And as you can see on there, it says it's a foundation stone. And that made me wonder, well, hang on a minute. Well, how can this be used as a foundation stone in the foundation of the building? There has to be something more to it than that. So when I walked past it, I decided to, um, when I got back, to look at the alignment, see what energy is actually running from it. And one of the things to notice is directly behind this um, stone here, uh, there's an elevation. There's a, there's a mound with trees on it and also a lot of earth. And looking at historical uh, imagery and um, through mapping, I can see that previously there used to be a ditch in this area, which just seems completely out of place in an industrial estate because there's another industry in the other side of it. Why have this kind of linear mound going in this direction? What was there previously? So I have actually discovered that there's um, a cross point of two energy lines running through here. One of them is the one that runs from um, Critch Mount in Derbyshire. And there's another one which runs from um, from the south to north, which is exactly three degrees from the raw Ro right um, stone circle in, um, in Warwickshire, on a Warwickshire Oxfordshire border. And um, the other line which runs through here runs exactly from east to west, which is a midsummer energy line which is aligned to the winter and summer solstice as well that runs through this particular for this particular point and then moving further um come to the next slide just um in front of the um this stone where the driveway is there are a couple of other stones which are just lying on their side and this one looks to me like it's made of um, limestone and as you can see i would have thought this would have been a standing stone because it's got a flat base that would have been standing and they've actually positioned it so it's actually laying down now. So from my research, when I find stones that are laying down, it should have been standing. It's a way of trying to divert the energy from the ley lines going into a certain direction. So it's like encouraging the energy from the ley line to go in towards that where that standing stone is, where the two different energy lines meet. And um, here we can see a Google Earth image of where the standing stone is on the industrial estate. And literally just a few hundred um, feet down the road, just below the 10 pin um, bowling alley, is where the um, Sikh temple is. And what I found was interesting as well, directly to the west of where the standing stone is, um, I've discovered that um, that's where the Rosalind Franklin Laboratory is. And that was used as one of the um, testing centres, the largest testing centres for what's been going in the last um, three years in the UK. And uh, basically, um, that particular centre, testing centre, cost the, uh, pretty much nearly £1 million, um, pounds, so £1 billion, to create, to be used as one of the largest testing centres in the world. And um, after 18 months, um, they didn't know what to do with it, and I believe it's actually been closed now. So there you have a, another sign of harvesting, because you sort of think, well, hang on a minute, a million a billion pounds just a million dollars in order to build a facility that will only be used for a short period of time why waste that money where does that money come from you know to build those facilities it comes from the um from the taxpayers basically so i see that personally as a form of harvesting because people are their hard-earned money that's being harvested for something that's only going to be used for a short period of time less than uh, 18 months so in my opinion that's another example of um, a form of energy harvesting and then slightly further along the alignment we come across an area here um, in Warwickshire which is um, Edge Hill and I know Michelle has done a previous um, video uh, regarding Edge Hill in, um, in, Liver in Liverpool I believe it was with some um, tunnels but what's intriguing about this particular point where they cross is um, the energy line coming from from that standing stone from Critch Mound happens to come across this place and this is one of the um, first um, civil wars that the UK has had in, in the history so there's been a lot of uh, battle and death going on here in, the, in this present in this area and just to the um, to the north side here there is a place that's actually um, a burial grounds where lots of bodies have actually been um, discovered possibly from what's happened during where the um, where the battle happened in Edge Hill, which is one of the most famous battles. 
And what I've noticed as well is this all this land here is owned by the military. What Adam is trying to highlight here is extremely important. All locations of battles and wars, all of that energy, all of that death, all of that anger, all of that passion will then be soaked into the ground, into the area. That area then becomes an energy hotspot, either via changing that location and spreading that negativity into the ground, or once the battle has commenced, the energy that has been put into the ground taken. Further to this point, how much does a battle sound like battery? The word battle is literally in battery. Battles, two forces opposed against each other. We could see this on a battery as negative and positive. Fighting for one winner to oppose, but in doing so, so many casualties, so many death, so much energy drained and used in one Pacific location. The battles of the past where they took place would now be full of energy. And this highlights why they build around these Pacific locations, which Adam will further go into. And in doing so, they harvest the energy from these locations, these past battles, which is still in the ground like a buried treasure. And the first thing that stuck out to me are these um, areas here, which look to me like grids, as you can see. So to me, they look like kind of like battery packs of some kind, similar to like a vehicle battery because of the um, grid, grid designs. So I looked into great detail, done some more research on it, and actually discovered that all these green points that you can see, these grids, are actually underground bunkers. And we were told that these underground bunkers were used for a primary purpose of um, storing um, ammunition during the um, Second World War. And, this, and then the other thing that I realised was these bold lines here that go all around these two, um, these two grids are a railway line. But looking at the railway line goes, it seems to be connecting just to these two grids and doesn't seem to be serving any settlements or any other purpose other than feeding into these grids. So what were these grids used for? Harvesting the energy, considering it was used as a as a battlefield, one of the, one of the bloodiest battles that were used in the UK. And it leads me on to, because Chad in one of his previous videos mentioned about the um, giant trees and the Burton Dasset Hills. Um, they just happen to be located just uh, um, to the right here, just where Little Dasset is, where there could, was the potential of being an old giant tree harvesting the energy. So you've got a natural element here. And then what was on this land before with what's happened historically the battle. So I see this as being used as an area of harvesting energy of some description and then further down it continues this particular lay alignment onto the raw what the roll right stones which is a famous stone circle um, um near back um, in oxfordshire and it's um quite interesting as well because um michelle has come up about the um that she's doing a video later on regarding um, alistair cowley and regarding one of the stone megaliths in um, Cornwall, which has a which has a circle inside the actual stone, the Rorite stones also have a circle within one of the rocks. But this particular circle is probably about the size of some of this clenched fist that you can actually get through. So it's a much smaller circle on it. So that this is another connection with the actual stones. Let's go back to my slide, and then we'll get to this yep. in just a little bit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to go into Arbor Low on the next one. And this was from uh, something you sent me, Chad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to point out, and you were talking about etymology, Chad, and that's not my strength. But since you've got me thinking about trees a lot more, what's an arbor? <laughs> an arbor is a shady garden alcove with sides and a roof formed by trees or climbing plants trained over a wooden framework Brilliant. and then a low is a low point level or figure and um you see low and high associated with lighthouses a lot the low light and the high light so that makes me now think that maybe there's a connection and if we just put a h <laughs> in front of harbor 
it, a harbour. It makes harbour. And a harbour is a place where ships come. And again, ships could be related to lighthouse and also a docking of energy or a docking. Do you know what I mean? You see how all the lines converge as well. It's just there's a lot there with that etymology. Good, good, good spot though, Michelle. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely thinking along the lines that you're, you've been exposing Chad with the importance of the trees and um, mm -hmm. how the ancients might have actually been utilizing everything to terraform. Because I, I do think there's a connection. Um, you know, maybe on the locations of, of trees. But, but not done in an energy harvesting way like I think happened in the 19th century when they cut all the trees down. Um, I think maybe more in a constructive kind of way with mm -hmm. the energies and, you know, just something significant about um, the actual function and role of trees. So um, that kind of brings us to rugby in England and North Dakota. And I'm just going to share a few things and then... Um, stop screen sharing so Adam can talk about his discovery. Okay, this is a good place. Because um, cement is another bizarre connection to all of this. And you picked up on rugby, which was on the first part of the alignment that I was tracking for the correlations of mines and mineral occurrences. It goes through rugby North Dakota. And Adam sent me the link to Rugby Cement. And um, it was Rugby Lias Lime and Cement Company was the original name, and it was founded in 1862. So we're still kind of in that mid-19th century time period. And um, when I saw that, I looked up Lias Lime, or however that's pronounced. Um, and before I go on, um, there's Semex mentioned in here and um, there's a couple of things I think going on with cement. And one is that, that they are uh, pulverizing ancient megalithic blocks and, and turning them into cement. So that's one way of you know, disposing of the evidence of the um, megaliths. Um, I, I definitely think that's going on with that. And then I think there's another connection to what we were talking about previously um, with what might be going into some of the cement. And um, you know, I don't really know enough about it to talk about it, but I have seen things and see references to um, to that <laughs> disposal mm -hmm. of other organic matter mm -hmm. that was once human. So um, I don't have a reference that's hard to find if you're looking for it, but I have seen that come up on alternative information threads that I follow. So I looked up Blue Lias or Lias, and um, so we're told that Blue Lias Lime was part of the Blue Lias formation that's found in southern, eastern, and western England and South Wales, and that it's a sequence of limestone and shale layers formed between. 195 and 200 million years ago. So, you know, they're, they're always giving us this, you know, far back in the fast, past, you know, geological explanation of how this was created. And this is a formation in Wales, um, in Glamorgan. And that's what it looks like. And we've always been conditioned to see that as like sedimentary layers and, you know, made by nature. But you know, I'm just asking if you can maybe see a wall in there, um, because that's what I see, and it's just part of the cover-up of, you know, how they've managed to keep this hidden from us. Um, and then I found this example of an abandoned tram station, and I think it's in your neck of the woods, Adam. Um, it's in Wilmcote. In Warwickshire, and yeah. it's three miles or five kilometers north of Stratford upon Avon, mm -hmm. and it's an old tramway made out of blue lias lime. And um, it's the description that went along with the picture when I found this was, it was uh, a derelict building and canal in Wilmcote. And you know, as we go forward with our conversations, um, 
there's a lot of abandoned rail infrastructure found all over too, above ground and underground. And so, um, you know, just wanted to share that because, you know, they want us to believe that they went and they mined the stone and they built this, you know, whenever they built it in the 19th century. But, you know, I, I think a strong case can be made that it was already there and they're just kind of putting a label on it and making it make sense, trying to make it make sense in our in our historical narrative. Yeah, okay. So uh, when I was watching the um, Shell video regarding the rugby in uh, North Dakota, um, something clicked in my mind, well, hang on a minute, could that possibly be connected to the uh, rugby in Warwickshire? So the first thing I did was just take a um, Google Earth shop to look at um, rugby in North Dakota, and I noticed that there was a uh, quarry close by to it. So then the first thing said that reminded me of rugby in Warwickshire being used as a cement works where there were a lot of historical quarries in the area. So I knew there had to be a connection. And then I looked into the um, research that I've previously done and actually realised there was an energy line connecting uh, rugby North Dakota to rugby in Warwickshire. And before watching Michelle's video, I did not know about the rugby in uh, North Dakota, which just identified that particular alignment that was um, already in, in place. And here you can see where the uh, alignment goes from um, rugby in North Dakota, goes through to um, Hudson Bay, all the way through to um, across Greenland and through to the um, to the rugby in the UK. And it gets even more interesting because rugby up until a little while ago was considered the geographic center of North America. And rugby in England is considered the geographic center of England. And the Isle of Man is considered the geographic center of the British Isles. And now the geographic center of North America has been moved to center North Dakota, which is still on this ley line, right, Adam? That's you correct, it out yes. And... It's still on the lane, it just goes um, further south. But there's a deviation as it approaches, um, goes further south, uh, a magnetic deviation that um, where the energy seems to go further south for, towards the um, two fort locations. And I've got some slides From... showing that. Okay. So um, so anyway, um, and, and you further found that um, there's a Merida, uh, or Merida, and we're going to talk about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk do about you have later any more in the slideshow. I mentioned that regarding that in the UK, because there's a Merida which goes through this alignment here in the US. And it's also um, a couple of areas in reference, which I'll mention um, in, in a few moments, regarding um, the, the Meridian in the UK and how that's connected, especially with the um, central part of the UK. Because um, as uh, Michelle um, rightly said, this particular um, ley line in the UK uh, actually passes through the south of the Isle of Man, which is considered the central point of the UK. And then this particular alignment sends directly south through to the, the most central part of the country, as you can see here, where rugby, which at one time was considered the um, central, of, of central part of England. And then that continues further down um, south, which is going to be details in a moment. So this is a picture of the um, cement works in Rugby. So here's just a, an image of the cement works as it is today. And as you can see, no thought and consideration has been taken to the local people living within the area. As you can see, it's literally slap bang next to us. Uh, uh, the household, you know, resident settlement right next to it with all the um, fumes, as you can see, being emitted from it, as well as the traffic fumes that get get emitted every single day. So I'm sure, you know, because you used to go to rugby quite often, it's not too far from us. As soon as you go into rugby, you do feel that the energy, that the actual air seems a lot dirtier because of the pollutants on it. And this is one of the contributing factors. And there was an area just to the um, to the west, to the east of this, in um, Duns Church, and they've got some weather monitoring stations. And a few years ago, that was said to have one of 
the worst um, air quality from the pollution within the UK because the amount of traffic that's been generated from this cement works as well as all the processes in order to process the cement. And here we can see uh, another link with the rail links as well with the cement, with the um, railroad tracks, with the old cement works to transport some of the um, some of the products. So again, we have the um, railroad connection there. And um, as um, Michelle has mentioned as well, regarding being um, producing the um, the lime lime mortar and the limestones. It was considered as being the finest place in land in the UK for its um, lightest limestone in the country because of the mineral content where the cement works is actually situated. And I was quite interested in doing my research to find out that in 1965, they did actually construct a 57 mile or 92 kilometer underground pipeline tunnel to transport shore as slurry from Kensworth Chalk Pit in Bedfordshire, which is 57 miles away to the rugby plant. So you sort of think um, having some, some tunneling or piping system for 57 miles is quite, um, you know, quite a significant achievement. You know, did they actually build that tunneling you know, specifically for that? Or was there existing tun tunneling infrastructure that they could have reused and serve for this purpose? Yeah, I mean, there's just definitely something. I was, I was just going to say, there's yeah, definitely yeah. sewing going on with um, with lime and, and lime kilns and things like that coming up in the research that I've seen in the 19th century. You know, that they that whoever was behind whatever were, were keenly interested in in lime and mm -hmm. harvesting lime um, from these Absolutely. locations. And so, you know, I feel like it's kind of knocking around something hugely significant in terms of what's actually going on here. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. um, but what I'm seeing, um, you know, with, with the example of the cement plant in rugby, as well as all the communities that have mines and their economy is dependent on work there. And so, you know, they have to, you know, work to earn a living to live and they're working for a major polluter or the environmental devastation of the mine. And then particularly with mining, you know, in some kind of out of the way place, after a year, two years or five years, they're gone and there's nothing left to replace it. And that story is repeated. So the, you know, the communities are devastated, the environment is devastated and the companies don't give a flip about what they've left behind. Absolutely. No and the, concern This particular whatsoever. cement works in rugby is a great example of that, Michelle, because um, as you can see, it, um, from the research shows that um, 2 million tonnes a year, it's producing 2 million tonnes of cement a year from this particular processing plant. So you think, you know, what pollution that involves. And um, because of the new site was actually opened, what, what the pictures we've seen on it in February 2000, costing you know millions of pounds in order to develop and um, it was estimated that that would produce between 800 and a thousand lorries traveling to and from the site adding extra pollution for those thousand lorries a day what's that doing to the air quality of people living in the area and it's something that the, these corporations um, in my opinion seem to be uh, do nothing about it's perfect recycling isn't it guys it, it proper's like That's puns it. the word I mean, recycling you know they're killing you <laughs> and then using you for the energy and then you know, it's just crazy isn't it <laughs> yeah absolutely it's crazy and then um what's um quite interesting as well um there's a village um just to the east of rugby called hill morton and it's quite a significant place because i really uh, found out that um, in this particular village which is a suburb of rugby now uh, there used to be a famous family in the 1840s called the Morley family and as soon as I read that I thought of the Moors and looking at this picture it's not very clear it looks to me like some of those people standing on there could probably be of the Moorish um, descent because 
I'm not sure if it's um, quality of the picture, but some of those look to me like they could possibly be of that um, Moorish, Moorish descent. Mm -hmm. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, they've, they've. I mean, they've really done done a number on true history. Particular area of Hill Morton is significant as well historically, because it um, confirms that you know in the eighteen eighties. Um, there was a lot of um, brick brick makers there, so a lot of brickworks and um, quarries and sand pits within the area, because a lot of the people living in that were actually brick workers and stone workers living in that area. And what was more significant as well was um, uh, as the, the famous rugby radio station transmitter. So if we come to the next slide, we can see this was uh, literally just outside the village. And here we can see the, um, the transmission center that was used for um, radio rugby. And it had the world's largest wireless um, station with the transmitters, which were 820 um, foot high. And they had 12 of these, along with um, the total amount of mass adding up to 57 of the smaller ones transmitting um, um, low frequency to the, um, to the submarines and stuff like that. So basically there's a huge area. We go on to the next one. You can see um, this was taken in 2005 from the main network of the road on the um, on the M1. You could see the, the, like, like, there was this like town of these huge transmitters scattered in the area, which could be seen from um, 20 miles away, covering an area of um, 1,600 acres or 650 he hectares and this um, site is actually closed um, between um, 2003 and 2007 and as it shows on here um, that it was, it was used to transmit very low frequencies to the commonwealth as part of the imperial wireless chain after the 1950s add add just sorry mate this is what we're talking about, yeah. though, in terms of replacing, aren't we? You know, hijacking natural Absolutely. creation. You know, if we look at those masses trees, but giving out good vibrations, you know, <laughs> that's reminding me of the Beach Boys. I'm sorry. I, I love the colorful clothes you wear. Um, and giving out goodness, and then these masses are doing the complete opposite, bro. You know, it's just. Absolutely. Yeah. And that goes as well because uh, it was chosen for its location for for because it's got lot um, limestone mice and, and sand underneath the construction. So if you think you've got for um, for over what sixty years that it's been used to transmit the very high frequencies, all that frequency will be contained within the um, within the soil of that area. Yeah, and the people living close in close proximity to that, I'm sure you know when it was in its height, when it was in full operation. That, that would affect the people's health living in the village of um, Hill Morton, for example, being subject to those high frequencies. Mm -hmm. And this uh, confirms on here that um, it said it was some secrecy regarding the one of the roles of the, um, the radio station. And it confirms that it was never actually used to transmit frequencies for the BBC as a public um, service, that it was actually used to um, connect to the um, station with the submarines used during the um, Cold War and things like that to transmit frequencies from one of being the most central parts of the UK. Why go so central? And what harm could that possibly have been doing to the people um, living in the area? Definitely. And um, just going on to the link of the railways, um, here is a um, Google Earth image now. This is where the um, rugby radio and the masts all work within this area. And you can see the railroad running straight through it. And it has um, the UK's uh, international rail freight terminal, the Durft. So basically all the freight coming into the rail, into the UK, comes into this particular area because it's in the central part of the UK. And it's also got the um, canal system, the Oxford Canal, that actually runs through it as well, as well as the main um, road networks connecting the M1 and the M6 to the rest of the country. And what they're actually um, doing now is in this area, 
that they're actually building developments of about 16,000 um, 16, new, home, new homes, producing a new, um, a new city, basically a new town within itself. After damaging the soil, lad, after spreading the frequency after all around the area. the soil, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's going to still be damaged. Yeah. yeah, so then that brings on me on to um, exactly um, 16 mile, miles to northwest of Rugby. Um, there's this place called Meriden, which mm. to me sounds a bit like uh, Meridian, as you get in the human bodies. Yeah. And um, this place was also referred to as the centre of England. There's quite a few centres of England that have been recorded, depending on which uh, locations they measure the centre point of the UK from. So this was considered as being what, the main central port in the UK. And I remember reading previously a few years ago that, uh, Merid that Meriden was actually considered as the capital way, you know, years ago before London was in existence that was considered as the capital of England, you know, literally thousands and thousands of years ago. And it's quite interesting in the centre of this village, there's this um, stone structure, like an obelisk kind of structure, which um, signifies that it was considered as being essential, the centre point of England. What's interesting to me is that that structure in the centre there does not look like the same quality of work. Um, it doesn't, no. That you would find in other places. It looks quite sloppy. So I would question it does. that it was built by the original civilization that, that probably came later. As that yeah, looks this horrible. to me, the way the formation <laughs> is that this was built, at, you know, at much, um, you know, later time, possibly even the last, you know, couple of hundred years or so. I was in the post of being yeah. ancient or, you know, megalithic. Yeah, that's really sloppy like, work compared. Absolutely. <laughs> comparatively. <laughs> it's highlighting. It's what it's highlighting the... is important now, isn't it, guys? You know, it, it, it's highlighting some potential um, spot there, isn't it? It reminds me of an acupuncture point, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of a meridian. Mm -hmm. um, it's sloppy work, as you say, but you can still yeah. see these places because <laughs> they're, they're, they're highlighted like that, regardless of what's there. Whether that's um, a, a clock tower, you know, something beautiful, just a flower garden. It, it's highlighting something. We have spoke about roundabouts as well, haven't we? Roundabouts often are pretty and often are very not. So that depends as well. Absolutely. And this just happens to be a small roundabout literally just in front of it as well in the uh, village of Meriden as well. So there is a roundabout literally next to it in the village. <laughs> you know, mm. mentioning roundabouts. Yeah. And then that leaves me um, onto the... Um, another section here where um, Michelle was going on about the hunting grounds because this um, particular the yellow line that we've got on here is the line that is the um, connecting the rugby to rugby North Dakota the rugby in the UK as if we extend itself it comes across to an area in uh, through the town of Northampton and it happens to cross an area of South Sea Forest and the South Sea Forest has been um, like Michelle was saying on a previous forest, that has been a royal hunting ground that has been used for people, dating back to, um, well, for a long time. But there's also happens to be a, um, a railway station that was put just, uh, just outside the um, South Sea Forest. That was the shortest lived of rail passenger service in the UK. It only was put in place and only served passengers for five months, say for four months. And they're telling us it was a judgment by the railway company because there wasn't enough traffic coming through on it. So why spend all that investment putting a station in and then not having it used for what it was intended for? Mm -hmm. So like Michelle was saying on the previous video, you know, why, you know, it was open in 1892. Why close it four months after it's been opened? That story was that? repeats itself over and over. It keeps yeah. repeating itself as well, all the time as well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, as you can see here, um, there's a lot of historical um, oak trees, especially within the Selsey Forest, which happens to be seven miles away from the town of Hampton and 7.7 .7 miles from the um, city of uh, Milton Keynes, where this ley line continues going through to. So you've got the sevens, which keep coming up in a lot of the stuff that we're researching as well. So it mentions some of the historical trees, which they call the droids, which are old trees, you know, over 600 years old. 
and one of the most famous ones was the milking oak where basically the cattle used to be milked so i kind of see that you know milk that's kind of like being harvesting you know so what else were they harvesting apart from the milk from the cattle for example was there enough of a purpose on it especially being a royal hunting ground and this is uh, an example of the uh, one of the historical trees that was situated in the forest. So you can see by the by the trunk, it would have been a rather large tree that has been um, hollowed out from this artist's impression. And there are so many of these historical trees, a lot of which have now been cut down. So that's um, pretty much regarding um, that alignment. So do you want to carry on, Michelle? Um, there's just a few more points to make um, with regards to the alignment from Rugby England over to Rugby North Dakota and, and points south of there. And I want to touch base on that um, because your, your findings are pretty significant. So this used to be the geographical center of North America in Rugby North Dakota. And um, and I think you mentioned there's a large open air coal mine there, Adam. Yeah. Okay. So um, center is now the geographic center of North America. So here's rugby. Here's Winnipeg, and you know just extend down the line that Adam showed previously. And as we mentioned, the ley line also passes through the south of the Isle of Man. And as you were saying, it seems to be connecting th at least three central points that are the middle or center of their respective regions. And I just want to point out that the symbol of the Isle of Man is called the Triskelion, and it looks similar to the symbol of Sicily, which is called the Trinacria, um, which I found in past research. So I've known about this for a while. And you can find these two versions of the Trinacria in a search. And it's interesting that they've changed what looks to be two serpents around the woman's head with the wings to wheat stalks. And you still have the wings, um, you know, but that seems to be a reference to Kundalini energy and, you know, reconnecting with our crown chakra and our higher selves um, that's been scrubbed altered but i don't know the significance of that why it looks pretty much the same except for what's on it with the three legs but it's interesting uh just just quickly on the wheat i think it's because of the genetic programming of wheat and then it can be programmed down genetically not only that there's a lot going on with the programming of wheat in our foods, isn't it? One way to spread some it. There's a lot with the wheat. It's like the butterfly, the monarch butterfly, that can be genetically modified and programmed. Um, it, DNA. It's just another way for me for representing DNA. It could be represented in a few ways. I'm messing that's with that. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that. I just thought of it as being, okay, I'm going to alter, alter this picture so they don't have any idea what we're talking about. But that makes a lot of sense. They're all in our food um, there as well as us, but yeah. So, it's right in the middle of my thing here. Oh, there's a Surrey up here too. <laughs> um, so this is Center, and you mentioned Fort Clark and Fort Mandan, Adam, and I'll let you talk about that, and also Merida or Merida, Meriden, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Meridian. So and, so uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about Washburn. Sure. Yeah, because if we were to extend the line from um, rugby over coach here, it actually goes directly to this um, to this area here, this estuary. And there's a magnetic deviation that you can check out on um, Google Earth. And for some reason, the, en the energy line seems to be flowing south towards where this other, I believe it's a, it's a river or canal that's in this area, is it? Looks to me like. It seems to be attracted to this um, formation of where the where the Fort Madan and Fort Clark are. So that tells me it's either the um, material used in it, or the geom and and the geome geometric shape of that particular fort, the man-made structures, 
that are changing the flow of that energy in that direction because of that magnetic deviation in the area. So in my opinion, that's an example of how modern man-made um, structures can change the flow of the actual, um, of the two lower earth energies, of the natural energies, which the earth has from it from the ground. So that gives a great example, because why else would it, would the energy suddenly be diver diverted where these man-made structures have been put in place? You know, there's a reason for it. And just one point before I move on to the last couple of slides. Um, so you see what looks like a lake, you know, some kind of body of water up here. And to me, it has a classic appearance of uh, what might have been a canal or something originally that got flooded, um, probably because there's infrastructure underneath this location. It looks the same. Um, that's one of the ways they covered this up. They they flooded original infrastructure and then they turned it into a reservoir and water supply and and whatnot nobody knows the difference you know unless you start really looking looking around it and going and seeing it and going to some lakes outside where i was living in oklahoma at the time oklahoma city at lake thunderbird in norman oklahoma and lake arcadia in edmond oklahoma i saw that was where i first started to see the evidence that you know in fact that's how they were covering up ancient infrastructure so I just wanted to point that out because that's what it looks like, you know, just kind of like a fat lake or river or vein. <laughs> Go into veins there <laughs> yeah. for you, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want to make a point because I noticed Washburn situated between the two and it brought back to my mind that um, when I was tracking the route of Lewis and Clark um, from their expedition, in the early 1800s after the Louisiana Purchase, um, they went right through here and they were said to have built, get my, my stuff out of the way here, figure out what I'm doing. They were said to have built Fort Mandan to live in for the winter of 1804 and 1805. So that was attributed to Lewis and Clark and their, their group. Washburn, was said to have been founded in 1882 and named after entre entrepreneur, politician, and soldier Cadwallader C. Washburn, who founded a mill that later became General Mills, a big food company, cereals and things like that. So Lewis and Clark came this way, and I think their story was very different than what was advertised, and a lot of the... Um, 13 family names came up on this trip of their expedition, like DuPont and Astor and Rockefeller and Standard Oil. And, you know, now seeing, you know, the central location of this journey just adds even more um, questions to what the Lewis and Clark expedition was actually doing there. And, um, I, I question a lot of the history that we're taught anyway. And, you know, I think at some point that our history becomes real history and that the controllers have written themselves into the narrative and they're telling us what they're doing. I think before that time, they might have based some things on loosely on some real people and events, but I just really question, you know, the reality of a lot of what we're taught about our history. Um, as we go back in time. And then when I talked about the shoddy looking place in Meriden, I just kind of give you a better example of what I'm talking about with the obelisk in La Crosse, Wisconsin, where the founder of Washburn, North Dakota was said to have been buried. So this was his memorial. And, um, that's another thing they did with obelisks and other, you know, antiquitech and infrastructures. They turned them into memorials and, you know, had this whole story about what, <laughs> when it was built and why it was built. And, you know, to me, this is an example of the handiwork of the original civilization and, and not what we saw a couple of in, in your slide presentation, Adam. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you find a lot of obelisks are, that are somebody's memorial. <laughs> yeah. All over. <laughs> yeah. 
And, and I just want to show one more thing, if I can figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, it was enclosed then, as well, Michelle, wasn't it? That with the blue fence around it. Was talking about uh, a deer park earlier in the enclosement. You know, and especially like on the old photos of the Axis Mundi and stuff, when you've got the tree in the middle. You know, <laughs> the representation almost. So this is the Royal Royal Pavilion in Brighton Beach. It was built um, in 1787, starting in 1877, as, or 1787, as a seaside retreat for the Prince Regent George. And that it was built in an Indo-Saracenic style, prevalent in India for most of the 19th century, and is the work of architect John Nash. But, I mean, to me, that's it's kind of like a classic Moorish temple. You're talking about the the Sikh temple. Um, it's quite um, coincidence relating to rugby because one of the alignments from rugby actually does pass along to Brighton, and it does actually pass through this uh, Brighton Pavilion. So you know they're all connected energetically through these um, these alignments. It right. just goes to show, and why is the architecture the same on these alignments? Michelle, exactly. have you covered the Salt Lake? Because that pier, that pitch you was just showing up, it was just. It was like, wow. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's the they used to went swimming it, and they it's, it's like an 1800s built um pier. That's it there, Saltar, the Saltar. All that, I just I just thought it looked very much like that <laughs> with the dome shapes. It was that the uh, they yeah, do, but, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, a lot could have changed, couldn't it? But from the side, you know. It, yeah, so it's Salt Lake City. It's other oh, great Salt Lake in Utah. And you know this this gets, goes back to this was a worldwide Moorish civilization. Mm -hmm. Rewritten the narrative and you know chopped everything out of it, and they burned down a lot of these places. White City, in um, in London. Um, I'm going to share my screen again, just to give you an example. It's, this this doesn't exist anymore. They used it for um, several World's Fairs, and and it's gone. It's I mean, it's completely gone. And it's it's just beautiful um architecture. Mm -hmm. And they've supported their narrative by getting rid of everything that contradicted their narrative. And and again, I'm just I'm just making the point that it's hard for people to grasp because um <laughs> you know, we just it's gone and there's a story around the stuff that still exists i'm looking for a ride that was called the flim flam and i want to say it was um let me try this you could probably come across all the piers then couldn't you from what from what i've just saw if you went across all the piers you could you could match up all the world again it's just more evidence across all the piers couldn't you potentially yeah i can't find what i'm looking for but um you know talk about the chicago world sphere it was also called the White City, like White City in London, you know, with canals and gondolas and, you know, this beautiful architecture and our, an obelisk right here. Um, and then there's hardly anything left standing of the original Chicago World's Fair, but this is what Chicago used to look like. And and they've just destroyed everything and you know, replaced it with, you know, far inferior infrastructure and experiences but um i'm not i'm not personally i'm not guessing when it comes to this more civilization the evidence is there but we don't see it because it's not supposed to be there and because it's been attributed to other builders you know like john nash with the royal pavilion in brighton beach and sir christopher wren and you know, all these other people have been given credit for it. Yeah. But they didn't build it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I found it interesting that if we change one of these in deer and it's the same, it's deer, as in deer, isn't it? You know, the deer that you, you put on top of a letter, mm -hmm. which means something of high importance, you know, or high regard. So it's only small, but I just thought that's what I was doing, messing around with different things. 
And this gets us to the idea that these places of these deer parks were significant, very significant. Um, if we flip the letters in deer, spelt with the EA, we get reap. So, you know, that's also significant of potentially, well, we know what's going on at these places in terms of the harvesting, etc. It, it's in it's in it's in the, the wording. Thought that was weird, turning it around, you had beer. And then when Adam was talking about all the wheat and barley and everything to do with the mills. And also hunting as well, harvesting and hunting are so inter interconnected. Like we've discussed through the hunting areas, all the hunting grounds, obviously with deer. And with windmills and stuff like that, that's harvest. It's all some kind of harvesting energy. Yeah. Because hunting can be seen as harvesting as well. Because obviously you're, it's, it's a similar kind of, just a slightly different definition of the same thing. 100%. What else what I was thinking with the, the beer ad? It influences, doesn't it? You know, it's another one of those things that severely influences. Um, somehow from Pia, India, this is, yeah, I got to Peter Parker. And I just thought that was funny because... You know, Deer Park is very similar to Peter Parker, but then Peter reminded me of Pete, you know, the Pete that you find in the ground. And I, I know, I know it's all a bit... It makes it's... sense, though. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know, mate, it's re very revealing. I found Beale in there, and I know one of the devil names for for um, for, for, for the devil it was Beale. And also, funny enough, the police first name was the Peelers. I know that's probably mm -hmm. no relevance but um one of the fans i think about deer is what a deer represents and you know when i was looking up it said spiritual authority you know um and it, it's it's quite a symbolic representation isn't it and the deer actually represented the ancient civilization of mu um that makes sense you find you find deer imagery um like tibet the seal it has two two deer um, facing each other, kind of like two sphinxes facing each other. And also, um, it, it shows up in imagery of the ancient civilization. So th I'm sure there's a connection with that. And they've just inverted everything and yeah. turned it into a spell or, you know, something to bind us. Because I'm, I'm afraid that's what's been going on. <laughs> I wish I had a happier story to tell, but, you know, they're they're definitely intent on on binding us and you know, keeping us distracted and not focused on what's really going on and harvesting our energy. I, I agree so much, myself. I agree so much. So, so in regards to, say, the deer parks, we think something more was going on. I think there's a lot pointing towards that. But it, it also could be a symbolic representation of what you've just said of the older civilization. And the hunting of these deers is the representation of the hunting of the people of the past. And then the regeneration of the growth of the park and things like there's just so much there with as as you've just hit the nail on the head with with deer itself. You know, when we think of the deer parks. Um yeah, and here it talked about the deer representing gentleness, heart, intelligence. You know, so they're hunting that. It's love ultimately, isn't it? And and positivity. Right. Uh and the, that's the reverse of what they want. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so th that absolutely resonates with me, Chad, because um, you know, the original human is a fractal of the creator. And if we knew we had all those superpowers and we we're aware of them, which I believe that the original civilization was and how they were able to create all these amazing things. Um, you know, they don't want that. They want us controlled and they want our energy because they don't have it. And they Absolutely. would be the negative beings that have set up the system in the new world and the, from the old world. Absolutely. And it's hiding the old civilizations, which actually did live in peace and harmony with the architecture you know different centuries you know all parts of the world where they living you know fighting each other they're living in harmony in order to create something positive 100%. and they've used race and religion to divide people instead of unite people yep. and um again to keep the focus away from them and on each other so we don't question what else might be going on 
and they you know my understanding is they can't touch us anyway because we're sovereign beings and so they've had to create this unnatural system and um get us to do their their dirty work and unfortunately mm -hmm. it's been you know up quite effective i i don't believe that they're going to get away with it no it's um, over now because everything has a cycle now it's the end of their cycle because you know it's all been set in stone for cycles a certain period of time and they know it's over it's just that they're just throwing their their, their toys out of the pram at this stage at the moment <laughs> just trying to right. grab hold of the last bit of control that they think they have but you know they know it's all over so <laughs> yeah and and i know the intent of my work is not to scare people and say they I mean it's been bad you know it's it got really bad here but um that's why i want to end on a positive note because a lot of people know the negative stuff but they don't know the positive stuff or the spiritual stuff and um you know want the evidence of things that they can feel and touch and see and when the news and the news cycle is all negative and what seems to be going on is all negative and i'm not saying it's not negative it is but for whatever reason it has to play out a certain way um to get people to wake up and really realize what's going on because it, it literally got into everything what you what we're speaking about michelle with race and religion and all that it's everything we spoke about prior to this as well sports you know every anything that creates division unbalancing I feel people, all they need to do is just not pay attention to any of that ball that they try to do. At the end of the day, they're going to pit you against blue v. red or white v. black, you know, to, to choose a side to unbalance us again, to separate us. And we need to just see through that. That's our power, our strength. It's just not being influenced by that outside world, isn't it? And, and just before we leave, I know it sounded weird before when I was talking about the car parks, but... I was thinking about it and ultimately all a car is is a vehicle similar to what the body is and something that struck me with car parks in particular what happens in car parks cars are set kept safe they say and parked but also cars are stolen they go missing <laughs> and the, you know you know where i'm leading to with this the amount of people that go missing inside parks <laughs> it's just a weird <laughs> weird similar coincidence and if you put them next to each other, they spell the same car and park. If we change the C and the thingy, it, it's exactly the same again. Um, I just wanted to show you this last bit. Sorry. Um, about Yeah, we know about everybody. Adam was speaking about this before, wasn't you, Adam? Ad, about the, fl the flow, about a forest and all um, the flow resting yeah. in a forest in a, in a park. But it got me mm -hmm. thinking about computers, which we already... We already speak about with the Earth's grid, didn't we? Don't we? So, you know, I was thinking about a battery and it reminded me of the word botany, you know, which is to do with the plants and the study of plants, their architecture, the structure. I'm just trying to speed through this, guys, for you without touch, you know, but still touching on it. Um, motor, when we flip the the, the, the W and change the, the O's, because, you know, I, I do that with a lot of things. It gives us water. And this was getting me down the lines of an engine, motor, um, towards more the computer chip where we're at before inside a computer what can happen inside a computer and also what i thought was interesting is one um uh, anagram of park if we was to flip the p it gives us carb so a carb is what we eat again and carbs are important and carbs are energy so all this, again, keeps leading back to energy parks, energy harvesting, all this same stuff. I found this interesting because if you zoomed in on, <laughs> on the picture, you can see uh, the swastika, which is actually the symbol of, you know, a very ancient symbol as we know, which has been inverted. But just a fan on a computer. I could put it, I'll put it on the screen for people so they can see it. Um, but, you know, looking down more it's similar sides, to that. Pardon, mate. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to those pictures uh, Michelle was showing on the Isle of Wight and the, you know, the flags and the symbolism of the Isle of Man, for example. Yeah, it does, it's exactly it? the same pattern. It, it's, exactly it's exactly the, the same. same. Yeah, yeah, it is. I'll put it on as well. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Um, so just heading towards more the chip, you know, the, the circuit board earth again. I found it was interesting with parks enclosures. And normally around a park, you've got a hence or a, a, a fence. 
And as Adam pointed out on my Oxford video with the chip being similar to the spires on top of the Oxford building, I found these very similar to almost the fence around a park. Um, especially in the UK, it's mostly metal fences. But then it got me thinking along the lines, guys, how could you connect multiple motherboards? Because batteries and the components to a circuit board, I can see more of them across the earth. There's not just one of them. There's not just one. Of, do you know what I mean? There's multiple. So then I was trying to find pictures of it. And I thought some of these pictures were really interesting because you could combine multiple motherboards together. And essentially what this would create for us, if we we're to talk about in a world scale, is the world. But like in terms of countries, mm -hmm. counties, towns. But it's a case of thinking of this circuit board as absolutely huge with potential additions added on. We see things replicated all over the world, don't we? You know, similar like things as well. And I'm going to the circuit board earth here, but I think it's all... No, it makes sense because with, with the circuit boards you're mentioning, Chad, someone has to come up with an idea of it. And where do the ideas originate? It usually originates from nature because nature's exactly, the mate. Yeah. ultimate creator. So they every, and you can relate everything man-made into the natural pattern of things. You know, it's there. We saw these before. This is like meant to be one of the biggest motherboards in the world. But look at that. You know, it's a cityscape. It's a city, isn't it? it? It's a city. So what, you know, but because I've not got an electrical background, I'm wondering, well, what's that? What's that? What's that? But interestingly on this mm -hmm. photo I found, I thought, I just thought it was interesting because there was a cross on it. And I just thought, I know it sounds silly, but a church, you know, like, I'm unsure I need to look more into electronics, but I think we've got some of it. When Adam was saying about the universities and the spires, I don't think we're far off with these type of buildings because the energy generating buildings are with that energy. But it's just, I think when we mention it to people, they just think that, and that's not big enough or it's not enough, but we've got to multiply that and add and add and add and add, you know, and we get multiple servers. And this is where we get multiple universes and all that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. It goes very deep. You know, how big is that? How many, you know, I'm unsure of the, the, the dimensions of it or whether, whether it's like that or more laid out like that. I don't know, guys, but just looking at that, come on. We get caught up on what we've been told in our narrative about when places were built. And, and sometimes it's hard to get past that timeline that we've been given and, and see everything as having been built as a circuit board up until relatively recently. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to go into that the next time we talk um, to show why I think that however they flipped the timeline took place relatively recently. And we're still using all of their infrastructure in cities and other places. Um, but it's been attributed to much more recent building and things like that. But it's, it still doesn't match what, we, what we're told we're capable of. Mm. Because the builders of this civilization were highly advanced and, and highly sophisticated. And they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly where they were on the earth and where everything connected together. To get the multiple motherboard effect of what you're finding, Chad, because mm. that, you know, totally makes sense. And yeah, that looked like a city. If you were to compare that and show somebody that, their body thinks it's a plan of a city, without a doubt. So, yeah. so Michelle, what you're saying, essentially, the old people, the, the, old, the older, um, the ancients, let's say, could have been engineers of great, you know, let's talk about a computer. It's an engineer, isn't it? It's, an, it's, 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 it's mm -hmm. a great engineer. And then that creation has been hijacked or um, twisted and changed parts and components of it, potentially from the original engineer or engineers. And this might go back to creator. I'm unsure how far we want to go, but, you know, it, it, it could plow down from that. But this 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 technological, you know, spiritual everything, because it's everything, isn't it? Essentially, it depends how it right. manifests itself. And they've just reverse engineered everything and, you know, changed it, like you said, and inverted it. And I mean, all you have to do is look at the world we live in today and the <laughs> gaslighting and the crazy agendas that are being pushed. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's insane. 
And I remember several years ago, I found a movie called Topsy Turvy. And it was about Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, and I want to say I probably saw it, um, let's say, in the late 90s is probably when I watched it. And if you look up things about Gilbert and Sullivan, there was a period of time called Topsy Turvy or Topsy Turvy Dumb. And I feel like that's what we're living right now. Mm. Good is bad, you know. Right is wrong is right. You know, that's being broadcast and blasted at us all the time. Well, it's not. And most people know that, but there's so much of it, it's just hard to kind of wade through the messages and saying, wait a minute, that doesn't, that's not right. What they're saying is not right. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. burning buildings is not a peaceful protest. I mean, but it's like we've been hammered. And that kind of gets into that other research that you're working on with the mind control and what's been going on with that and how that's kind of built into everything. So it's not just one program that took place, let's say in Montauk point, it's a worldwide application of how to control all of us. And, and I, I, I'm getting the sense, Chad, and maybe you too, Adam, and maybe with some of the things we've talked about today with the homeless shelters and, you know, the asylums of the past um, is that it's leading you in the direction of doing that research on the mind control stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think you started out there. No. I think you're probably, you know, <laughs> veering <laughs> off there because it's so glaring. Yeah. Did that MK stuff, Michelle, it's all new to me, but I've learned so much, you know, the programming, but it's everything. Yeah. It's all part of the same agenda in, which you keep talking about. It's it's the same thing, just the branch of it, if you like. Or, or... And I mean, the original so, humans absolutely. were sovereign. They were, you know, they were brilliant. They they knew how to work with the elements. They knew, you know, alchemy was, you know, a lot of what their was their knowledge. They knew how to apply that in a positive way. And the controllers just came in and just flipped the script. And, um, you know, humanity has been treated horribly. Yeah. And so um, I'll be looking forward to getting past this cycle and into the new one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I'm seeing is we're talking about the controllers being in power the last couple hundred years. I don't see thousands of years. I see hundreds of years in my research. And mm -hmm. um, they've done an incredible amount of work in that hundred years to bring us the world we live in today but um it's all about power and control and of resources of us of the grid and you know from what i'm gathering is they want to pour us into some place to where they can you know harvest our source energy forever mm -hmm. i mean that's what i'm what i'm gathering from all this stuff is you know we're the ultimate prize because we don't know who we are we don't know our power and so um you know they definitely see us as a as a prize and why they've done this so on that note take your power back people time to empower yourself in every single possible way no more to turn off mainstream <laughs> yeah 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 what turn they... off the mainstream news absolutely All of that. and what are they pumping out they <laughs> everything they're throwing out all the fear if people take their own you know sovereignty back and realize who they are and their true potential they're not going to have energy to feed off they're going to just basically you know distinguish themselves yeah and that's where we're heading and, so and you, just yeah. you know take and, back your control and we, we can't wait for energy. everyone can we we can't wait for and to do it like all oh, adam's family and all of warwick to do it we need to be the change so you know once we become that change we're the lighting we had and it, it's not about waiting for other people. It's about us, us trying to do that one by one by one. It's collectively becomes larger. And it's kind of a scary time to be alive, but it's also an exciting time to be alive. Mm. And, um, you know, seeing the awakening happen in real time, knowing that it's happening. And, you know, I know the reason we do what we do is because we want to get this, the information that we've received out to people, to, you know, to give them more information to base a decision on and um you know making a change you know do you go with the status quo and what you're told or do you start thinking critically and asking questions 
and ultimately arriving at the same place we have. No, just give them the option to search for themselves because you can't force anybody or tell anybody if they disagree with you. It's for them to discover it in their own way. So getting the information out there at least, you know, gives people that opportunity to um, see what is available out there and then choose for themselves whatever they feel intuitively which way they should go. Absolutely. And, you know, this, like you're saying, Adam, this isn't something that you can just tell people. I don't. <laughs> people need this information to receive this information when they're ready for it, or it creates dissonance and discord and conflict. And that's not where I'm going with this. Yeah. Um, people have to be ready for it. And that's the beauty of the internet and, you know, platforms like YouTube and things like that is the people that are ready for it, find it. Seek yeah. it. Look for yeah. it. One thing we can do, guys, everyone deserves compassion and love. That's what they will do, do deserve. And if we give that everybody, the, 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 some will choose that way because they wouldn't have before. Do you know what I mean? I don't I don't expect everybody to come to the same knowledge as and become a, a wiki that Dalsa like had or a perfect researcher like Michelle. I, I, I think we can definitely give compassion and love, can't we? And, and that's at the bottom line, that's where we're going because the only way out is up yep. and Absolutely. love is the highest vibration. Yes. We're not going to, we're not going to solve this by staying at the same level of consciousness that created the problem. Nope. So mm -hmm. you're spot Absolutely. on Chad. I mean, that's, that's where mm -hmm. as a collective, <laughs> we have to go, you know, you know, let the creator or the, you know, whatever, mm -hmm hold the people behind it responsible or accountable and i believe that that will happen we can't um contribute to the solution by being angry and upset about it though it's quite natural to experience that and i'm not i'm not knocking that i've, I've experienced that that's how am i going to get to love when my body's going crazy knowing what's going on um but but that's our challenge is that we as a as a group, not everybody, because it's not required for everybody. You know, it's that whole. Um, it doesn't change. A, it doesn't take a great shift in consciousness to change the whole direction. Mm -hmm. That's been shown. Uh, yeah. David Hawkins and Power versus Force. Um, it doesn't take everybody, but it takes enough. <laughs> it takes we're enough of us. We get, we're, we're that wake close, up. basically. <laughs> we're we're there, guys. We're getting there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not hopeless by any means. I appreciate the conversation with you, Chad and Adam. It's been lovely, guys. And, um, and we'll do it again soon because I haven't finished. <laughs> with, <laughs> with the, There's a lot more out with there. With the to presentation. <laughs> <laughs> There's more. <laughs> There's always more. Thank you so much, guys, for your talk. And, um, I'm pretty sure there'll be a follow-up of some sort towards this, won't there? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. probably this one, and then um, there's there's two more that I just didn't have time to put together before we met today, and that'll be more more revealing, I think. And you know, it seems to be synchronistically um, connected, so I'm sure there's going to be more. Yeah, how do I start this off? Because obviously I'm going to edit this bit. But do I? Um, <laughs> it's, it's just well. So like, what? What? Um, <laughs> hey guys, what are we doing here today? <laughs> it's like, so, um, so basically, um, I've got comp I've got the title of this as compelling evidence for the harvesting of the Earth's original energy grid system and us.